Professor Anil Narang was the former professor of Department of Pediatrics and Neonatology at PGI Chandigarh. He belongs to an era where, uh, of teachers where people were still learning to you know, spell neonatology correctly. And uh, you know, most of the people whom you see uh, speakers today are, are uh, you know, the Indian ones are, are his students. And uh, under his chairmanship, PGI Chandigarh was the first uh, institute in the country to start the DM program in, in the country and the rest have followed. He was an, he's an academician and teacher par excellence and his students are, uh, you know, have started building NICUs and managing NICUs across India and also abroad. He has keen interest in research and has numerous uh, publications in reputed journals. He has been awarded the Fellow of uh, Indian Academy of Pediatrics and also the Fellow of the National Neonatology Forum and has been part of, mem uh, of advisory and the decision-making committees of different uh, government institutions uh, and uh, government uh, bodies. He unfortunately could not be amongst us because of his family commitments. He had to travel to US, but I'm sure he will be delighted uh, because his oration is being delivered by his favorite uh, colleague and his student, Dr. Uh, Sarv Dutta. Every one of you has known him for last many years. I'll just read out of what is the important. He is currently Professor Division of Neonatology, Department of Pediatrics, PGI Chandigarh. He is adjunct faculty in neonatology in McMaster University, Ontario, Canada. He has done his MBBS, MD and senior residency from Ames, Delhi and fellowship in neonatology from Children's Hospital at West Mid, Sydney. He has also done PhD in neonatology from Chandigarh and has been awarded FRCPC in neonatal perinatal medicine in 2011. He has many publications, counting is the number if I have to say then in journal it is 117, he has 19 chapter in the books, edited 7 books, has presented award for best paper 12, has also been awarded IC Verma excellent awards, award in 2014 and has so many other awards also and he has contributed in a big way in the research in neonatology. His area of interest is that he is passionate about teaching research methodology and has conducted numerous research methodology workshops in India and abroad and interestingly his recent publication is a novel Line on a Map which is not a medical novel. It is a non-medical novel and it is available on Amazon and I am sure everyone is, seems to be equally interested in reading your non-medical publication also. Now I invite Dr. Saurav to please come on the dais and deliver the oration for the IAP Neonatology chapter. Thank you. This is indeed a huge honor for me and I really thank the organizing committee of uh, IAP Neocon and EBNEO for having granted this rare honor. I'm not sure whether they have chosen wisely, uh, but that's how it is. And uh, uh, for me, it's particularly precious because uh, Professor Anil Narang was my mentor. He was my role model, he still is, my philosopher, my guide. Uh, a lot of good things have been uh, spoken about him, but because I had worked with him very closely, I'll just like to mention a few, uh, you know, highlights of his, uh, you know, his sterling qualities uh, when we were actually working together. Uh, firstly, he was a thorough gentleman. I mean, he's still a thorough gentleman. I, I had seen occasions where even when he had very serious, you know, difference of opinion with professional colleagues, he always maintained his dignity and conducted himself impeccably. Uh, even for his, you know, worst detractors and critics, he would never have a, you know, an unpleasant thing to say about them even behind their backs, which is, I think, a great uh, quality. The uh, second very interesting quality was that he was always willing to listen to people completely, even when they were, you know, junior to him, and in situations where he had already made up his mind about what needs to be done. So he had already taken a decision about what needs to be done, say clinically, administratively or, or whatever. But if, you know, even a junior resident or a nurse came to him saying that uh, I have a different opinion, he would listen to that person, even if he had no plans to you know, change his uh, decision. 
which always made fee people feel important. And I think that's a very important uh, attribute. The third, you know, and all those of his students who have actually worked with him will agree with me, he had this rare way of combining easy approachability with maintaining a distance. I mean, I don't know how he did that, but that, that's a very important attribute for an administrator, and he was a very successful head of department of uh, you know, pediatrics. Because uh, if you are not approachable, you can't take everybody along. But if everybody is going to be, be your thick pal, no, nothing is ever going to get done. So he somehow managed to you know, uh, combine these two attributes very well. My only regret is that he is not here today. I mean, he's with his family in the US. So he won't be able to listen to this uh, oration. So now getting on to the oration. So I'm going to talk today about microbiota. And because it's a complex topic, we need to have a common understanding about certain definitions. So I'm going to start with an important definition, and that is, what is the definition of a baby? So a baby is essentially an alimentary canal that is very demanding at the upper end and has no sense of responsibility at the lower. You ask any new mother, and I'm sure she will agree with this definition. So since we're talking about elementary canals, let me tell you that all of us have always been taught, and these are you know, dictums and dogmas, that the neonatal gut starts getting colonized soon after birth. You know, we always knew that. But there are some sancta sanctora in the human body which are pristine, they are pure, they are inviolate, there are no bacteria in them. So we were taught that breast milk is sterile, that the placenta is sterile, that the amniotic fluid is sterile, the fetal gut is sterile. So my first question is, how does human gut colonization proceed? And this is just you know, an artist's impression. Uh, you know, don't take the values or the heights of these uh, graphs very seriously. And the artist happens to be me, so just you know, forgive me for that. So what happens is that the first few bacteria that get in and successfully colonize are actually E. coli and streptococcus. They are aerobic bacteria, they consume oxygen inside the infant's gut, create the anaerobic environment, which then allows anaerobic bacteria to uh, enter the gut and successfully colonize. So the next big colonizer is bifidobacterium, which uh, becomes the dominant colonizer over the first you know, six months of life in an infant. That is then followed by uh, bacteroides species, lactobacillus, and then enterobacteria see make an entrance. It is, some people say that about two years of age, the uh, colonization process completely stabilizes, and uh, th there's a lot of uh, you know, differing opinion as to when exactly the adult composition of gut microbiota gets firmly established. But apparently, once it does get established, it becomes very difficult to change that composition. You're kind of stuck with it for life. So where, from where do the first bacteria get into the neonatal gut? To answer this question, Carlson et al. did this very elegant study in 1975. What they did was they went to the delivery room. As soon as these babies were born, they swapped the baby's mouth in the delivery room before anything else could be done. First thing they did was to swap the baby's mouth. They also took the mother's rectal and vaginal swabs and they cultured it for lactobacillus species down to the strain level. And what they found was very interesting that there was a very high correlation between the oral cultures of the babies at birth and the mother's rectal and vaginal cultures at birth. The same strains of Lactobacillus jensenii were found in you know, all these cultures. And the source of the vaginal Lactobacilli of the mother was actually her own intestine. So it was a rectal Lactobacilli that were contaminating the perineal area that is colonizing the vagina and that is getting into the baby's mouth. And interestingly, on day six, when they repeated cultures, they found that the oral cultures had, in the meantime, become negative, but the neonatal stool cultures had started showing exactly the same organisms. So that means it was going all the way down, and that was being picked up in the stools. Uh, so the message was that the first inoculum probably comes from the mother's vagina and perineum at the time of birth. Many years later, the question was asked that could breast milk be a source of bacteria for the neonatal gut because the baby is breastfeeding? So Rodriguez et al. published this paper in the Journal of Pediatrics in 2003. This is a group based out of Madrid, and they have done you know, terrific work in this uh, field. 
What they did was they took eight mother-infant pairs and studied them. They did cultures and random amplified polymorphic DNA PCR, basically a molecular technique of breast milk which was collected absolutely aseptically. So what they did was breasts were washed thoroughly with soap and water. Chlorhexidine was used for decontaminating the uh, nipple and areola, sterile gloves, you know, surgical procedure. They discarded the initial, you know, four milk. They used a sterile, you know, breast pump, everything. They also took swabs of the breast skin before they did all this. They took swabs from the vagina. They took neonatal fecal samples and the neonatal oral swabs after a feed. And what they found was startling. They found that breast milk was not sterile. In fact, there were a thousand to 10,000 bacteria per ml of breast milk. And there was a very high concordance, absolutely identical genetic profiles between the neonatal feces, what bacteria they were getting, and the oral swabs and the breast milk. So that means bacteria were coming from the breast milk into the baby's mouth and then into the gut and into the neonatal feces. And, and even more interestingly, there was no concordance with the bacteria in breast skin and vagina. So that means these are not bacteria coming from the skin of the mother. They were coming from inside the breast. So the message is that breast milk has bacteria that colonize the neonate's gut. Now we do know that there are many parts of our body that are colonized with bacteria. You know, our respiratory tracts, urinary and reproductive tracts, our intestinal tract. And all of these have a connection with the outside world. Now the problem was, which is the most important source? The vaginal flora or the breast milk? That's number one. And number two, from where are these bacteria getting into the breast milk? Because the breast does not have an obvious connection with the outside world. So it is thought that probably breast milk gets reverse colonized from the baby's mouth. That means the baby's mouth is first getting colonized, the baby is sucking, those bacteria are going, migrating in the reverse direction into the breast, and that's how the breast is getting its bacteria. So to answer this question, the same group from Madrid published this paper in 2007. They used 16S rRNA gene-based PCR technology. What they did was they collected breast milk absolutely aseptically from five mothers with elective caesarean section, no rupture of membranes. So that means the baby had not had a chance to get exposed to vaginal flora. So the baby was directly now breastfeeding on you know, the mothers. Five mothers in which there was vaginal delivery. That means the baby had gone through the birth canal and there were mothers in whom they took pre-colostrum, that means the milk that is being produced even before delivery. So there was no chance of the baby having fed in, in such mothers, you know, out of question. So they extracted bacterial DNA, amplified the 16S RNA gene, sequenced the DNA and compared it with known gene banks. And what they found was absolutely astonishing. That was, there was no difference between the caesarean born babies and the vaginal delivered babies. So that means the caesarean born babies did not have an opportunity to pick up bacteria while they were being born. And yet the breast milk composition was the same. The breast milk was replete with bacteria and it was present even in the pre-colostrum before delivery. So the hypothesis that it was getting reverse colonized by breastfeeding was not true. So the message is that no reverse colonization occurs and breast milk is probably the more important method of neonatal gut colonization than vaginal delivery because it's happening even in those who are not being vaginally delivered. Now if, if milk is full of bacteria, why don't they cause disease? So, Riverego in 2005 published this paper. They checked bre breast milk enterococcus faecium for pathogenicity. So they used various molecular techniques to look for virulence determinants, genes involved in plasmid conjugation, antibiotic resistance genes, screening for virulence phenotypes. And they found, not surprisingly, that, the, that these bacteria in breast milk had no virulence genes, no gelatinase, hemolysin, or aggregation activity, no VAN-A or VAN-B antibiotic resistance genes, no plasmid conjugation genes. So nature has ensured somehow that the bacteria in breast milk are avirulent. Of course, a lot more work needs to be done on this, and right now, in fact, we are about to start a uh, study in which we'll be looking at, is it possible that some pathogenic bacteria or 
antibiotic resistance genes may be there in breast milk. Uh, but that's, this is still you know, an open question. Now, this was a puzzle that couldn't be, could not be solved for several years. So if it is not by reverse colonization, then how on earth are bacteria getting into the breast milk? And that's through a very elegant mechanism that nature has devised. It's the gut mammary axis. What happens is, we know that immune cells from the gut, the Peyer's patches and lamina propria in the mother, are capable of homing in on the mammary gland in late pregnancy and lactation. And these act as carriers, they're vehicles of probiotic commensal bacteria from the mother's gut. And I'll be showing you the experiments that prove this. So the thing is that the mother's gut and the baby's gut are very strangely intertwined. So this is a landmark paper that Perez published in 2007, which proved, gave the evidence for the gut memory access for bacteria. So what they took was, they took human mother-infant pairs, they did PCR and gel electrophoresis, and looked for specific uh, organisms, lactobacilli, streptococcus, enterococcus, peptostrepto, staph, and so on, and they went down to the DNA level to ensure that they were picking up exactly the same you know, DNA composition bacteria from the following samples. Maternal fecal samples, maternal blood samples, maternal milk samples, and infant fecal samples. And they demonstrated that it was exactly the same strain in all these four. They went one step further and they found bacteria actually to be physically visualized inside milk monocytes and, and peripheral blood monocytes of the mother at the same time, the same bacteria. Inside monocytes, both in the milk as well as in the blood. They then did animal experiments. Uh, this shows, you know, to the left, control mice. In the middle, pregnant mice. And on the right side, lactating mice. The black bars are the mesenteric lymph nodes, which are draining the intestines of the you know, mother mice. And the white bars are the mammary glands. So you can see there's a huge difference between the pregnant mice and the non-pregnant mice. That there's a sudden upsurge in the number of bacteria in the lymph nodes of pregnant mice. And those bacteria now seem to be getting transferred to the mammary glands after delivery when the mice are lactating. So, which are the cells then that are carrying these bacteria? And this is a, a diagram I have borrowed from uh, Nature Immunology. The, the, the candidate cells are the dendritic cells. So these dendritic cells have these long processes that emerge from the cells. They are immune cells. So uh, in this uh, diagram, the top part is the, is the gut lumen, inside the lumen. The green cells are the mucosal cells. And that yellow cell that you see there is the dendritic cell. So the dendritic cell virtually extends a process that goes between two mucosal cells into the gut lumen of the mother by a highly sophisticated mechanism which we don't fully understand. It samples the bacteria in the mother's gut, picks up the ones that the baby is going to require for its gut colonization. The cell then migrates through the bloodstream or the lymphatics of the mother, and again through not very well understood, sophisticated homing mechanisms, homes in just onto the mammary gland. It, I mean, it doesn't sort of go you know, everywhere into the lungs and the brain of the mother and so on. So it goes to the mammary gland and gets into the milk of the mother. And this is what is happening. Through the bloodstream and lymphatics into the mammary gland, then the baby feeds and gets those bacteria whose origin is actually the mother's own gut. So the job of immune cells like dendritic cells is to destroy bacteria. So how on earth are these commensal bacteria avoiding getting destroyed by the immune cells? And in fact, the immune cells are acting as carriers of these bacteria. So there are a whole lot of hypotheses. So these bacteria have evolved tricks to avoid destruction by the immune cells. So they may, may either, be, either be traveling attached to the surface of the cell instead of the inside, a bit like some of the trains in rural India, then it has been found that progesterone during pregnancy suppresses immune signaling. So these particular cells now don't destroy these bacteria. And there are certain strains of bifidobacterium that produce unique exopolysaccharides that allow it to remain immunologically silent. So they use these cells as carriers to get into the mammary glands. So now, 
are the immune cells, the dendritic cells, doing this all the time through, throughout a woman's life? Or do they know when they are supposed to carry these bacteria to the breast? So the mouse experiment seems to suggest that they seem to know. And that was replicated in this you know, wonderful study by Kodayar Pardo in, published in 2014, where they looked at the effect of gestation, being born at different gestations, on bifidobacterium transport. So on the left side, you have uh, the bif bifidobacterial gene copies per ml on a log scale. So each, you know, going from one to two means it's 10 times higher. And these are comparisons between preterm and term, preterm and term for colostrum, transitional milk, and mature milk. And any kind of milk you look at, you find that the amount of bifidobacteria in term mother's milk is about five to 10 times what it is in preterm milk. So that means the migration of these bacteria is actually peaking at term gestation just when the baby really needs it. And you know, that's how, uh, we don't know what are the signals for that, why it's happening only at the time of you know, term gestation and, and lactation and not before, not clear. So the peak carriage of bifidobacteria by dendritic cells is at term. Now, a little word about phyla and species. You know, so all those who work in the area of microbiota, they love to classify bacteria according to the phyla, uh, which is not you know, something that clinicians are accustomed to, so that's why I put in this slide. So there are four major phyla of gut microbiota. The firmicutes, the bacteroidetes, the actinobacteria, and the proteobacteria, and the species that we are commonly accustomed to dealing with so the firmicutes have lactobacilli, enterococcus, staph, strep, and clostridium. Bacteroidetes have bacteroides and prevotella. Actinobacteria have bifidobacteria. And the proteobacteria phylum has vibrio, escherichia, and shigella. Now, it will be tempting to say that the proteobacteria are the bad guys and actinobacteria are the good guys, but it is actually the balance between these that is more important. You do need proteobacteria in your intestine to have a healthy intestinal milieu. So you, you can't do without some Escherichia in your you know, intestines. So does the mother's gut and her vaginal microbiota change over the course of pregnancy to prepare for delivery? That means now that we know that the immune cells are going to pick up these bacteria towards the end of pregnancy, does the gut bacterial profile also change? And there's this wonderful uh, you know, review article published in 2016 uh, describing the changes that happen as pregnancy progresses. So as pregnancy progresses, a gut microbiota change to have a higher content of bifidobacteria, higher content of proteobacteria, there's less intra-individual diversity of bacteria in a mother and more inter-individual diversity appears. Similarly, changes occur in the vaginal microbiota. So there is much more lactobacilli that suddenly appear towards the end of pregnancy and less intra-individual diversity and more inter-individual inter diversity. So that means the vagina and the gut are actually preparing their composition and changing to allow this you know, colonization of the neonatal gut that's going to take place you know, a few weeks or months later. And of course, something very interesting, and I'm going to talk about that later, that bacteria start appearing in the placenta. So aerobic and anaerobic bacteria start making their presence in the placenta. So if, you know, we all know that when lactic acid bacteria are incubated with cow's milk, it curdles. You know, we are, we are doing that all the time when we are, you know, making yogurt at home. We take an inoculum of yogurt, which contains lactic acid bacteria. We put it into cow's milk, we incubate it, and it curdles. So then why does milk not curdle inside the human breast? I've never heard a mother saying ki maine dahi pilaya or uh, I, I fed yogurt to my baby or the milk just got spoiled in my breast because it was there for too long. You, you never hear that. So uh, to answer this, we just need to know a little bit about curdling. How does curdling take place? I mean, all of us are you know, making yogurt at home, but just to you know, revise that. So uncurdled cow's milk has a very high kappa casein content. So that's a protein in the milk. Casein is very negatively charged, so all these negatively charged molecules, they repel each other. So everything remains in a liquid state. So the sequence of curdling in bovine milk is as follows. So you put lactobacilli into the milk. Lactobacilli act upon lactose and break it down to produce lactic acid. Lactic acid being an acid has a lot of hydrogen ions which are positively charged. It donates those 
hydrogen ions to the negatively charged kappa casein and removes those negative charges. And because those charges are removed, they do not repel each other any longer. So at a pH of 4.7, the protein clumps and you get curd, which you're eating every day. So what, what we did in PGI, uh, totally unpublished, was that we incubated the yogurt inoculum and live probiotic colonies into warmed human milk samples that we took from our mothers and incubated it at 37 degrees and we kept waiting and waiting and waiting and no curdling took place. So human milk just didn't curdle, although we were using the same process. And why was that happening? So there are several hypotheses. One is that it has a low protein concentration, so there's less casein. It has very low kappa casein concentration compared to cow's milk. And possibly bacteria inside the human milk may be remaining packaged within the immune cells. That means they are not capable of going and actually acting upon the lactose because they're still inside the cells. The next question is, if it is all based upon the mother's gut, does the maternal diet, her environment, her ethnicity affect milk microbiota? I mean, that seems to be a logical thing. So it's very difficult to test all of these things at the same time. So what Kumar et al. from Finland did was, which they published in 2016, they looked at differences of milk composition between countries, taking the country as a surrogate, that it, you know, it, all dietary differences, you know, uh, environmental differences will be taken care of by they being from different countries. So they took 10 healthy, exclusively breastfeeding mothers from four countries, Spain, China, Finland, and South Africa, which you can see at the bottom. And they looked at the relative compositions of uh, you know, old friends, proteobacteria, firmicutes, bacteroidetes, actinobacteria, and others, which are you know, all color-coded. Now notice that there are big differences across countries. For instance, in South Africa, proteobacteria dominated the bacterial population of human milk compared to all other countries. In Spain, had the highest proportion of bacteroidetes compared to all other countries. Milk that was made in China had a dominance of actinobacteria compared to other countries, and so on. Now, does this mean that milk from mothers in certain countries is worse in quality than milk from other, uh, you know, certain other countries? Probably not. I think the more likely answer is that nature has evolved in such a way that the milk actually you know, is responsible for the local diet and uh, you know, climatic conditions and temperature conditions that is most suited for that particular babies being born in that particular country. That is a more likely explanation. So, are Indian mothers any different from this? So, to answer this question, yours truly and my friend Babatosh Das from THSTI Gurgaon, we did this experiment over the last two years. So we took 20 breastfeeding, absolutely healthy mothers, full-term normal vaginal deliveries, some of whom, many of whom had some amoxicillin intake, peripartum, some of them did not. Those who did have antibiotic intake were mostly three days or less. By an absolutely rigorous surgical antiseptic method in which breasts were washed with antiseptic soap, dried with sterile gauze, chlorhexidine, discarding initial amount of four milk, and using autoclave DNA-free collection tubes, we did this study. And we swapped the skin before sampling and also cultured those uh, skin swabs. What we found was that our mothers were very similar to the South African mothers. There was a huge preponderance of proteobacteria and much less of the other phyla. So very different from European mothers. We went one step further and tried to look at the actual genera comprising these phyla and we got the shock of our lives because the dominant genus seemed was pseudomonas of all things, much less of staph, enterobacteria, and that really got us worried that, I mean, how could breast milk be having pseudomonas? So we went ahead and did DNA sequencing of the whole, you know, of all the bacterial DNA that we had collected, with high throughput sequencing, and these were the species of pseudomonas that we found. As you would see, None of them are your, you know, usually recognized pathogenic strains of pseudomonas. A few of them in literature have been reported to cause infections in highly immunocompromised hosts. But by and large, most of these are just common cells. 
and uh, we are still working on this as to you know what is the significance of you know uh, these commensal pseudomonas species in um, uh, milk of indian mothers so considering that the bacteria go from the mother's intestine into the baby's intestine is there a transgenerational transmission of microbiota through breast milk and that is best exemplified by the vicious trap of obesity now i just want you to focus your attention on this it has been found that the gut microbiota of obese persons differs from non obese persons this is a well established thing through animal and human experiments that the ratio of firmicutes to bacteroidetes is much higher in obese individuals and there is much lower diversity of bacteria in obese individuals when an obese woman becomes pregnant her gut flora is not like that of non obese pregnant women it has much less bifidobacteria and much more of proteo and uh, you know other uh, species when this mother obese breastfeeding mother starts breastfeeding her breast milk flora is therefore different from non obese mothers who are breastfeeding again much low in bifido content and much higher in staph content and very importantly lower diversity so when she is feeding her baby the gut flora of infants born to obese mothers has much less bifido more staph and lower diversity and what is very interesting which completes the gap is that these infants then grow up to have microbiota that are different from non obese individuals and tend to become obese themselves so uh, this is all still work in progress a lot of you know research is still going on in this field and uh, for all those of you who like me are battling with obesity you can finally heave a sigh of relief so it wasn't your fault all these days it is all the fault of your gut microbiota and uh, better still you can blame your mother's gut microbiota and if both you and your mother are obese then you can blame blame your grandmother's gut microbiota and so on and so forth but it also shows where antibiotics get into the picture so if antibiotics are used indiscriminately around the time of delivery say you know intrapartum antibiotic prophylaxis early onset sepsis you know prophylactic antibiotics and so on you are disrupting the normal process of colonization and it has now been shown that the excess use of antibiotics is related to the obesity epidemic that we are seeing amongst human beings so there you go so now when all this was done people started wondering the what about the remaining sancta sanctora is it possible that even the placenta amniotic fluid and fetal gut are not sterile so i'm just summarizing all the evidence for that in one slide so jimenez et al in 2008 detected bacteria in the first meconium the very first meconium that healthy neonates were passing and you know raised uh, put you know the cat amongst the pigeons to so to say using highly you know sophisticated molecular methods a microbiome has now been identified in the amniotic fluid and the placenta and it shows similarities with colostrum and meconium this was a study done by agar in 2000 reported in 2014 a landmark study because there are a huge number of subjects using illumina which is again a very sophisticated high throughput you know dna sequencing technology in 300 mothers they detected a large placental microbiome and what is very fascinating similarities with the maternal oral microbiome which has now raised this whole issue that maybe that's why mothers with periodontitis have a higher risk of premature delivery because the oral microbiome is linked to the placental microbiome and with fish and classical histology bacteria has been demonstrated in placenta and through with an exquisite rodent experiment genetically engineered e coli which is not found in nature was fed to mother mice they were sacrificed and from the fetal mice exactly the same strain of e coli was found in the fetal gut before the you know fetal mice had even been born showing that the there is a maternal gut placental axis of transmission of bacteria as well so there are no sancta sanctora left in the human body is that surprising i'll just end with a philosophical take home message now if the earth's 4.6 billion year history could be compressed into one calendar year that means the earth is formed on the 1st of january today is the 31st of december then on the ab about the 28th of february bacteria first 
evolved on this planet. And a certain species called the Homo sapiens appeared at 11.45 p.m. on the 31st of December. So bacteria had three and a half billion years to evolve before we did. This planet belongs to them, it does not belong to us. They do not need us for their survival, we need them for our survival. All these bacteria that you're finding in placenta and all, they are not pathogenic, these are common cells which we need for our survival. So they have had all the time to adapt to every niche available on this planet. Thermophilic bacteria have been found in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean and inside South American volcanoes, surviving and thriving at temperatures of 120 degrees centigrade. They have been found in niches in Antarctica, multiplying at minus 20 degrees centigrade and lower. There are species of bacteria that can tolerate 6,000 grays of radiation. They have evolved to survive in every part of this planet. And we human beings had the temerity to think that one amniotic membrane and one mammary gland would have held these bacteria at bay. It is therefore no surprise that bacteria crop up in the unlikeliest of locations in the human body and demolish our most long-held and cherished beliefs. So ladies and gentlemen, the sterility, the sterility was never in any part of our body. The sterility was only in our imagination. And with that, I'll end with this quotation by the German philosopher Nietzsche, who said, there are no eternal facts, just as there are no absolute truths. With that, I rest my case. Thank you.